Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us. My name is Samantha Diebel, and I am the Assistant Director of Alumni Engagement at the University of Colorado Boulder's Leeds School of Business. Leeds is a top business school offering undergraduate, MBA, MS, and PhD programs, and has an alumni network of over 41,000 strong living and working around the world. We're excited to have Tulane Medaner presenting on how to use the secret laws of attraction to get the career you want. A few housekeeping items before we begin. First, if you have any questions now or during the presentation that you would like to ask Tulane, please send those questions through the question and answer interface. I will monitor the questions as they are submitted and Tulane will answer them during and at the end of her presentation. As a reminder for optimum audio quality, we do have everyone on mute except for myself and our speaker today. If you experience any technical difficulties during the webinar, please notify us through the chat interface and one of our support specialists will touch base. Upon leaving the webinar today, you will be prompted by Zoom to visit an external website which will take you to a brief feedback survey. Your feedback helps drive future content and speakers for our webinar series. Lastly, do note that a link to access the webinar recording will be sent to all registrants tomorrow. Now, I'd like to introduce today's speaker. Tulane Medaner is the owner and founder of LifeCoach.com and author of the internationally best-selling book, Coach Yourself to Success, 101 Tips from a Personal Coach for Reaching Your Goals at Life and in Work, and The Secret Laws of Attraction and Coach Yourself to a New Career, Al McGraw-Hill. She has gained international prominence as a professional life coach by guiding thousands of people to create their ideal life and find wealth, success, and happiness. As a leader in the cutting edge field of personal coaching, Tulane helps provide restruct people restructure their lives to easily attract the opportunities they want. Her company works with executives, public officials, entrepreneurs, and business owners around the world in person, by phone, and online. Tulane leads numerous seminars nationally and internationally and has taught at Coach U, where she received training as a professional life coach. Tulane is an adjunct professor for Georgetown University's Institute for Transform Transformational Leadership and Coaching, where she leads courses on authentic leadership. She holds a degree in international affairs from the School of Foreign Service and a master's in English from Georgetown University. Prior to becoming a life coach, Tulane held a corporate position as second vice president at Chase Bank in New York City. Tulane has been featured in numerous magazines from Newsweek to Men's Fitness and has appeared on national and international television and radio programs, including the BBC and CBS Saturday Morning. Welcome, Tulane, and thank you so much for being here today. Yep. Hello, I'm delighted to be here. And oops, I better start my video here. Let's get that going. Hello, everybody. I just wanted to say thank you for having me. And we're, we've got loads and loads to talk about. I want to start off with just a little bit about, because I've been coaching now for over 20 years, and just want to let people know what I do uh, as a coach. And one of the things is it's not consulting, which is more information-based. Uh, coaching, life coaching is really, a, uh, covers the whole life. We look at people's businesses, their careers, their work, their families, anything that comes up is, is fair game in life coaching. Uh, but that being said, we don't talk about therapy issues, which tends to be issues that are unresolved in the past. So, Coaching, typically, we look for people who are healthy, well, successful, but maybe a bit stuck or a bit frustrated or can't figure out what to do or think they should know the answers but can't figure things out. And so that makes it most similar to sports coaching in that with, when you have a sports coach, you're working with somebody who's going to encourage you, somebody who's going to motivate you, somebody who will hold you accountable, and somebody who will kind of bring out the best in you, somebody who will make you go more, do more than you think you can do uh, and really bring out your best and your, your biggest potential. So that's really what we do in coaching, which is very, again, very distinct from uh, therapy and distinct from consulting. So most people, when they work with a coach, they have a gap between where they are now and where they want to be. 
They want to maybe change their careers or find the right relationship, start their business, uh, look for an encore ret uh, sort of retirement career. So then generally people want something different, haven't quite figured out how to do it on their own and decide, hmm, maybe I need some extra help here. And that's what keeps me busy and the team of coaches that I work for and, and work with in Life Coach. All right. So that's just a little bit about coaching. Now well, let's find out a little bit about you guys. I have two questions for you, the full questions, and Sam will, will uh, fire these out so you can actually vote on these and answer them. It's kind of a, a fun way to interact here so I can know a little bit about you. So Sam, if you're ready to launch those. Uh, great. great. Yes. Thanks so much, Tulane. So the first question here is, have you ever worked with a career coach or life coach before? Looks like we've got about 50% of folks who have voted, so we'll leave this open a little longer. Just curious to see if this is becoming a more popular choice for people or not. All right, great. Thanks, everybody. So I'll go ahead and close the poll here and share the results out. So Tulane, it looks like most folks, 78% of those who answered have not worked with a career coach or life coach before, and 22% have. Wow, well, that's pretty yeah. cool. <laughs> that's good. Great, well, we're, we're growing in numbers then. Yes. All right, and, so oh, go, go ahead. Yeah, go right ahead. All right, so I'll go ahead and share this next question here. So we want to learn a little bit more about where you are in your career path. So are you about to graduate? Or are you in a midlife career change, uh, about to retire or semi-retire or have an encore career? Um, or are you falling into the other category? Um, and then also, if you are answering other, if you want to share what that is in the chat, that would be great so we can capture that. Good. All right, so I'll leave it open for a little bit longer here. It looks like we've got about 70% of folks. Yes, it's curious for me to know where people are and in this stage of their careers because we have different different ambitions at different times in our life it's very different when you're just about to graduate as opposed to somebody who's uh, in a mid-career change yes all right so i'm going to go ahead and close the poll thank you everyone and share the results out so we can all see so Tulane, as you can see um, the majority 62 percent are in a mid-life career change We've got a handful of folks about to graduate. Good luck to y'all. Um, and 14% uh, about to retire or semi-retire, and then about 16% in the other, which is admitted grad student, um, late 50s, moving forward on a career path, uh, recently laid off after a 20-year career with one company, so looking for a new opportunity here. Um, so I'll go ahead and uh, hand it back Great. to you. Great. Well, thanks so much. Appreciate you guys taking the time to answer. It's nice to know who's here. It looks like we've got a, a lot of midlife uh, career changers on board. So that's great. Let's talk a little bit. So, so what we're going to do, and I've, I've got a very, very short period of time to give you, I hope, a lot of interesting information and uh, perhaps a way of looking at things as you, as you look at about how you can be more successful in your career. And the, the laws of attraction, let's start with, because we're, we're talking about how you use the laws of attraction, which is a bit of a woo-woo sort of uh, notion, right? This whole attraction stuff can sound a little bit woo-woo, but it's actually a lot more scientific than we think. <laughs> so, uh, and of course, our thoughts we know are, are powerful. So the first law of attraction is that like attracts like, and that our thoughts can manifest our reality. And Henry Ford said, if you think you can or you think you can't, you are right. And that is the premise that I follow on. So in a sense, Henry Ford knew about this way back when. But in April 5th, 1999, so this is, is it 99? Yeah, Newsweek had an article that I thought should have been the cover page. And it was called Thinking Will Make It So. And it was written by Sharon Begley, who's written a number of very interesting books about the power of our thoughts, the power of intention. 
And this article, she's done the research on it and has pretty much, we've proven that thoughts are not this fluffy, insubstantial stuff that we sort of hold them as, but our thoughts actually interact directly with the physical universe. And it was a bunch of, of researchers who were in Germany who were working with people who had been paralyzed entirely, uh, either through Lou Gehrig's disease or through an accident. But these people were so paralyzed, they couldn't speak, they couldn't move, they were completely paralyzed. But these were normal people otherwise. They had working brains, they weren't brain damaged, they, they could think, they could hear and they could think, and they could see, but they couldn't move. So can you imagine the horror of that, of kind of being trapped in a completely useless body, but having a completely sound mind? And so obviously there are some people who are trying to help these poor trapped people. Uh, and in Germany, they had, uh, in, in, did some research where they taped, they were able to tape electrodes to the side of people's heads, not inserting them into the brain, just you know, on the side. And of course, these people, the, the paralyzed people could still hear. So they used sound and they used a computer screen and through sound, they were able to train the people to spell words out from a computer screen, thinking about one letter at a time. So if they wanted to focus on the letter A, they, they'd look at that, they'd think about that, and it would pull down and they could pull out the letter A. And this way they could write sentences and communicate. Uh, I mean, this was amazing. Of course, now that I'm sure they've gone wireless by now, but that was back in 1999. So, you know, just amazing how, we, you know, they've proven then through that, you know, help, trying to help these people, that our thoughts actually are electrical signals that go out into the universe. So there we go. They're real and they can be picked up by a computer <laughs> screen. And uh, it just, it's just amazing. Because I mean, I, I sometimes think we don't, give our thoughts much credence. We don't think of them as being real because we have thousands and thousands. I, can't, I don't know the statistic, but there's thousands of thoughts that we have every day. Uh, we're constantly thinking about stuff. And so when you think about that and your thoughts are real and now we know it's proven that they are real and interact with the physical reality that we have. And so the reason this is, is because, and this is why the laws of attraction work, is that everything is energy. So Einstein figures that, figured out E equals MC squared. We know that the whole universe, even though it feels like, you know, this is my solid book here, you know, it feels solid, it feels real, but we know that it's actually all energy because matter is energy. So it's all energy, it's all this, everything's fluff in one sense. <laughs> so nothing's real, it's all fluff and stuff, it's all energy. When we take apart an atom, we can't find anything solid inside of it. So, you know, as far as we know, it's, there's nothing real in the world. So it's kind of funny, the way we interact with things is if it's physical and real and solid, when actually nothing's actually solid in the whole universe. So this is why this attraction stuff works. Now, on a more practical level, so the, you know, the scientific basis of this, this is very real. Uh, you know, and on a practical level, you guys also know how this works. When you are thinking about somebody and then they happen to call you, is that coincidence or is that that your thoughts went out there and that person's attuned to you like a, a radio station and is tuned into your signal and they kind of get your message. So we don't think of it that way, but it's, you know, your thoughts are real, they're going out there. And your friend is probably attuned to you or your family members so that they might pick up on your signal, okay? So it may not be, and again, everything that seems magical is just because we haven't figured out the science behind it. So I don't want to, uh, you know, I know it's fun to think of things as being very mystical and, and kind of magical and all that. And the effects of using the laws of attraction do feel magical because it's so easy. It feels a bit like magic. It's like snap my fingers and something appears. And that's kind of the way it works. Uh, and it's not as magical. It has more to do with the nature of the universe with energy. Right. So although I think the laws of attraction have been presented in a very mystical way by the books like The Secret, my approach on it is actually much more physics based, much more laws of science based. OK, so we're going to we're going to kind of pick apart that uh, mystical stuff and we're going to actually focus on how the physics of it works more. OK, and how you can use that in your career. So in in general, 
we've been taught that there's a, a primary way to get what we want. We've been taught to set a goal. So you create your goal and against that goal, you might have a strategy or an action plan. And then you start working down your action steps and, and get to what you want, right? And I'm sure if we did another poll, I could ask you know, if anybody has ever set a goal and achieved it successfully. I'm sure every one of you have done that. You have set some goal and you've managed to achieve it using that strategy of creating an action plan and going for it. So in life, it works. Goal setting can work. It can be very, very effective. It's a good tool. But there's another way we also get things that we want, and that is that we attract things to us effortlessly without trying. So without much work, without having to do any particular action plans, without a strategy, you could just have a, a wish, a notion, a thought, and then ta-da, the thing you wanted shows up in your life, or the person you wanted, or the opportunity. So that's the kind of easy, effortless way to get stuff. And it's a pretty good technique too. So if you start thinking back in your life, you know, I've just asked you to think of a goal that you've achieved, but you might also think in your life, okay, what have I attracted? What have I just had, what's landed on my lap without any particular effort? Have I made a wish and it's just come true? So I'll bet you, if you add up your list and look at what you've had goals around and what you've attracted, you might find that there's a lot of really good stuff was on the attraction side. Maybe you kind of a fantastic job opportunity landed on your lap or you met your uh, spouse or your partner or a friend and it all just kind of happened without you doing much work at all. And so I'd like you to actually do that, not with this middle moment, but as a homework assignment, and there's no, you know, all good coaches give homework. So I'm going to give you some stuff to work on today. So I'd like you to actually think about that and see you know, which method actually works better for you personally? Uh, can you combine them? And of course, I like combining things. So why not have a goal and then attract it to you effortlessly? You know, so you can do both. You can go about seeking, doing actions and stuff and being very attractive about how you do that. So there's no reason why you can't combine these two strategies as well. Right, so the, and here's the thing. We, we tend to give ourselves credit. Oh, I achieved this goal. We give ourselves personal credit for that because of the work that went into it, the effort that went into it. We say, yeah, I really did that. When we attract stuff, people tend not to give themselves credit. They don't think, oh, I'm a naturally attractive person who draws people and opportunities to me without much work. We don't think that. We think, oh, that was serendipity. That was luck. It was good karma. We give some outside power. The results, the credit for that. We don't take any credit for that. So the, the thing that I want to, it's in a sense, teach you is how you can actually become more effortlessly attractive. And again, mind you, this doesn't have to do with appearance. You know, you, if you look at people who are really irresistibly attractive, uh, I think of Danny DeVito. Danny DeVito is not technically very physically attractive. He's short, he's bald, he's, um, not very attractive, but he is attractive, right? You know, if you look at Danny DeVito, he's irresistible. You'd eat him up like candy, right? He is attractive, but he's not. So again, physical appearance, you can be very attractive and be 250 pounds. It, you know, it, you, it doesn't matter. So this is the whole thing. The attraction is about the energy that you're putting out there, right? So we're going to work on your energy because that's what we know is the real currency of the universe. It's all about energy. And it's your energy that's going to make you more attractive to somebody, right? All right. So now, how does this connect to career? Because, you know, we can go off and talk just about the attraction stuff. But the, the fact of the matter is the laws of attraction work on everything. So you can use them to attract a love life. So if I could leave this class and be talking about how to attract a mate, a partner. You can use this to attract a career. You can use the laws of attraction to attract a new sofa, <laughs> a car, stuff, you know, material things. It works great for that too. So it doesn't actually matter what you want to attract. So it works for everything. So I'll, I'll just give you a little example of how to, to tie this into your career. So very simply, uh, dressing one level up or dress for the job that you want to have. So there were, we had a lot of questions um, come in about changing industries. And I used to be in banking before I was a life coach. 
Uh, and in banking, there was a certain attire. In fact, this will tell you how old I am. It, women weren't supposed to wear trousers. We can wear pants to work. Of course, I live in England now, and if you say pants, that means underpants. <laughs> so in England, they say trousers. It's one of those funny things. So women weren't supposed to wear trousers to work. We were supposed to wear skirts with stockings or nylons, and that was what was required, and pumps, uh, some sort of a heel, ideally. So that was kind of the, the dress code. And of course, I broke those rules and started wearing trousers to work, and then it became a fad. And of course, now look at all the women in banking who wear trousers. So, so you, you have to take a look at that. But in this case, if you want to be promoted, are you wearing the right clothes? So if I were wearing trousers, I, the reason I wore trousers to work was because I wanted to be fired uh, and I wanted to start my coaching business. So I was willing to press the rules a bit. I was really willing to be fired. I was willing to take some risks that I wouldn't have been willing to. So let's assume I wanted to stay in banking and work my way up the career. I probably would have not done that. I would have tried to fit in more and I would have looked at what my bosses, what they were wearing. Are they wearing suits? All this stuff. I had um, just with the, one of the tellers, the banking tellers, wanted to go for the sales position. I told her she had the long dragon nails. And I said, cut your nails. You got to cut your nails. You know, it gives the wrong impression for that level of job. So little details like that just could end up affecting you in your career. You think, oh, it's okay to have those long nails. Well, you know, she didn't cut her nails. And guess what? She didn't get the job. You know, those things you just, just have a bigger impact impact potentially on one career or another. If you went into advertising, the long nails might have been fine. Uh, so thinking about that, these subtle things, if you want to work on the laws of like attracts like, the other key thing is to start doing the job that you want to have. So if you are in one industry and want to switch to another industry or a different, you know, really changing industries, it really helps to start getting familiar with that industry. So before you get that job, you might want to join the association or the groups there where that people in that industry hang out. So if you want to go from banking, say, to advertising, you'd probably want to find out, well, where do the advertising people go for happy hour after work <laughs> and go there? You might want to find out um, what associations could you join where there's, is there an advertising association that you could become a member of? You know, at the moment, you'll be bringing in your banking expertise to that, that's fine. Uh, but again, starting to get, starting to do the things that would make sense in that career. And then, of course, when you go to interviews, hang out in the lobby and see what people are wearing. <laughs> are they all coming in in jeans and platform shoes? Or are they wearing suits? What are they wearing? Because you don't want to come from banking wearing some sort of banking suit and then show up looking really stiff and uncomfortable and out of place if everybody's wearing jeans. So, um you know, just, this is the like attracts like. Very basic stuff, but people get this stuff wrong all the time. Uh, it's starting already to do what you want to do, and it could be that you start doing a, uh, something in the evening. You have a little hobby business. Like, oh, I'm going to take an advertising class in my spare time. Start doing what you want to do now, and this starts attracting more of the same, especially if it's in alignment with your values, so we'll get to that. And then, of course, hanging out with the people you like and that you want to work with. You could even start your own business. Maybe you want to start um, learning about advertising, take some courses on that, and then start a little evening advertising business or a marketing business in the evening that you run from your, your desktop at home. So all of these things are just ways where you can start taking, all right, if, if like attracts like, I need to start creating a bit of that business now or that industry now in my life. And I need to start meeting the people now who I'd be working with in the future. So this is, you know, it's, 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 it becomes quite easy then because if you're passionate about something, you start doing something that you like and you're interested in that, then you're going to find the right people who are going to say, hey, wait, you know, we're having this thing. Why don't you apply for this job? Or, hey, you did a really good job with this. Or, you know, so you start to get the opportunities and attract them to you instead of making it so hard and so difficult. In fact, it's one of the hardest things to do is switching industries using a resume to do that because your resume will read all wrong. So you've got to have another st strategy to do that. You need a different technique. And the attraction stuff is going to be the way forward for you. Right. Any questions so far? 
again, folks, any questions that you have, feel free to submit those through the question and answer. Um, Tulane and I was saying no specific questions, but some comments around the laws of attraction, also um, being called the cosmos, and how we're thinking about um, using this with, with our kids and instilling this in the next generation, and then also thinking about attracting effortlessly, but not just giving it all up, being active, um, as you're talking about here. Right. Good. Good. So it sounds like people are, I mean, this is, this is great. We can start teaching our kids this because why is it just that we teach them goal setting and not, yeah, why not be more attractive? And in yeah. a sense, you know, it's a perfectly valid strategy. It's another technique. It's a, it's a tool for your toolkit. So, you know, the, why, why do we only think about it one way? Yes. And so one question that yeah. has come in. So regarding your comment about resumes, um, so saying that agreed the resume does not read towards the direction that the individual wants to move to in their next career. So how do you suggest navigating that speed bump? Yeah, with, with resumes, um, you know, I'm not a, a resume writer and I, I think you've got a fantastic uh, a webinar there, Sam, in your, you know, at the university that will help people with that so that you know, really you should look into more detail on it. But basically, if your resume has the wrong sort of career tr path behind you in a sense, which mine did, because I wanted to go from banking into life coaching. So, it, and of course at that time, there was nobody gonna hire you as a life coach for a company. There were no coaching companies. It was all brand new. This was some 20 years ago. There was no company of life coaches. <laughs> you know, mine was one of the first companies of life coaches to actually exist. So you couldn't get a job in it. You couldn't apply for it. But to say there were, you know, and I come from banking, I would need to change my resume into a functional resume and talk about my coaching skills. So the things that I used in banking, and this is a, a, a technique that people who are good at writing resumes do very effectively. And you would definitely want to hire a professional to really massage your resume so that it's more functional, it emphasizes, yes, I have coaching skills, uh, whatever particular skills of management skills, whatever, sales skills, uh, organizational skills. So you, you focus, focus on your skills and experience that you have that's applicable to any industry. Um, and so that's the key there, so that your resume matches the job more. And of course, each industry, they might have different sort of standards for what they like their resumes to look like. And of course, you want to like attracts like, make sure your resume matches up so that you're not going in there with a, a banking sort of looking resume going in to apply for some other job in, in fashion or something. So you want to make sure that they match up or vice versa. And that you are using that principle of like attracts like for that. But again, going with a functional resume, focusing on the, the networking, like we talked about before, start to get to know the people, start to do informational interviews with people who are in that field, getting to know them, getting to say, well, what, how, how were you successful in this business? How did you get started in this? And asking them those kinds of questions. I really am a big fan of, of informational interviews with people where you're not applying for the job, you're just saying, oh, I wanna learn about this industry. And go on lots of, go on any informational interview that you can uh, and do it properly. You know, send your thank you notes afterwards, treat people to the lunch or dinner if they're sharing information, say, oh, can I take you out to lunch and treat you at this nice place and ask you questions about how you, about your career, because I'm really interested in this industry. And most people who are passionate about what they do are very happy to talk about it. And, you know, you'll learn so much that way. So I, again, Getting closer to the people who are already in that industry is the key. And the great way to do that is with those informational interviews. So I think that'll, that'll help with that question. Um, let's move on here. So let's talk about the corollary, corollary to the law of attraction. And so if like attracts like is the first law of attraction, then the corollary to that is if you don't need it, you'll be more likely to attract it. So we know instinctively that neediness is bad. <laughs> we know if you bump into a party to somebody who's needy, 
we can't run away from them fast enough. So we're desperate to get away from them. We'll make an excuse. Oh, I, uh, sorry, I need to get a different drink or I need to go to the bathroom or you'll, you'll say anything you can to get away because you can sense neediness and it's repellent. It really is. When people are desperate, they, we can sniff it out on them. And then I don't know, you know, we might not know particularly what the need is that's making us feel that we need to get away from them, but that's what happens. So we, as, as, a, as, a, um, as human beings, all human beings have personal and emotional needs. So that's part of being human. I didn't figure this out. This was Abraham Maslow's work with his hierarchy of needs. And, uh, but the key thing here is, if you don't know what you need, you might be a little bit needy. So this is a big problem. People don't necessarily know what their personal emotional needs are. And so they run around being a little bit needy, even if it's very subtle or very tiny amounts of neediness that can still push you, you know, push people away from you that you most are, you know, the ones you most like and want to attract. You think about it, it's obvious, the clinging vine in the relationship, whether they're a male or female person, pushes that other person away. If you call too much, if you're desperate, you push the other person away. The one who doesn't need is always more attractive. I mean, even if you think in banking, what I used to work at Chase, and if somebody came in and they were financially needy, they had a lot of credit card debt, so that would be very needy. Uh, we, if they were too needy, had too much debt, we would say, I'm sorry, but we can't give you this debt consolidation loan that would really help you. Uh, we can't do that because you have something that we call excessive obligations. <laughs> so basically we're telling people you're too needy. <laughs> we don't want to touch you. You're desperate. And so even in the financial world, it works. Now, the other opposite is true. You come in, maybe you have a bad credit rating, uh, but you have some money in the bank. You have some savings. So you don't actually need a loan. Oh, okay. Well, we'll give you a loan. We'll secure your your assets will secure your savings account and give you a loan based on that. <laughs> so when you don't need it, yeah, you can get the loan. So this is just the whole irony, the catch 22 of life is that when you don't need something, you're more likely to attract it. If you're very popular and have lots of friends, it's easy to attract new friends because everybody wants to be your friend. So it works that way in everything in life. So this is a key piece of this attraction. I'm not going to have you do this now, but if you want to find out what your needs are, this has been such a sticky issue and so difficult for people to figure out. I've had to actually create a quiz. And the coaches on my team, we worked on this years ago, and it's a very organic quiz in the style of a cosmopolitan quiz. Nothing complicated. And this quiz you takes about 20 minutes to take, but at the end of it, you will be handed your four top personal and emotional needs. How easy is that? Okay, so you don't have to spend years in therapy figuring out what you need. You could just take this little quiz and you'll know. So that's our, my gift to everybody. It's free. So let's just talk a little bit about this because it's, the needs are so important for attraction because we know neediness, unfulfilled needs, especially emotional needs, drive people away from us. The opposite of attraction. We know not needing money makes it easier to attract more money. You can take that loan, invest it in a business, make more money. You know, so they say it takes money to make money. In a sense, it's true. And it's also true that you know, the debt attracts more debt, whereas uh, if you have savings, it attracts interest, so you attract more money. So it's the like attracts like works in the financial area as well. So let's, let's just look at these needs here. At the bottom of Maslow's pyramid here, his hierarchy, He's got the basic needs. These are your survival needs. So we've got the safety, security, food, water, shelter, rest. So that comes first. These are absolutely essential to your well-being as a human. If you don't have enough food, you will starve to death and die. So critical, mission critical to get these sorted. Now, in the developed countries, we pretty much have these cracked. We've got good systems to fulfill food. In fact, it's become so well satisfied that we have the opposite problem. We eat too much <laughs> and gain weight, <laughs> and that becomes a health issue, which can kill us too. So we've gone over the scale to the other side, and now we have got too much food uh, in the developed countries. So it's now become a, a problem of too much, not too little. So, uh, so, so there you go, basic needs there need to be handled. Again, excess is not necessarily the answer either. Once you have your 
physiological needs satisfied, then you start thinking about, oh, what do I need emotionally? What are my personal and emotional needs? That takes us to the area of love, uh, feeling accomplishment, your achievement needs to achieve, needs to be a uh, part of a community, need to be heard. So we've got tons of different emotional needs. And again, sorting out what those are can take a lot of time. Do you need to have order in your life? Do you know somebody who needs order? Somebody who needs uh, to be cherished or appreciated? Those are all very common needs. So we'll sort out the top needs for you so that you know what you need because <laughs> if you think about it, <laughs> I said, okay, we go into personal relationships, we get married thinking that our spouse, our partner, job, it's their job, isn't it, to meet our personal and emotional needs. And if they don't meet them, then we're not satisfied and we get divorced. So this is really important. I think if people knew about their needs before they got into relationships, <laughs> that would be a good starting point. <laughs> so we have this crazy expectation. But even in careers, this applies. So you could imagine if you're emotionally needy at work, you're going to be wanting too much attention from your boss or maybe doing things that are inappropriate. Uh, if you have the need to control, you might be too bossy or controlling at work. So again, finding healthy ways to satisfy your needs at work is also important, but you don't want to come across as needy. And then at the top here, this is what Maslow calls self-actualization. This is what I call living in accordance with your true values, your core values, your passions. It's doing what you love to do. Uh, and at that is our peak experiences in life, when we're most happy, when we're most self-expressed, when we're doing what we love to do. That's when people feel lit up and alive and are excited and passionate about what they're doing. It's because their life, their work is in alignment with their core values. Right. So we're going to talk about how you figure out what those values are, because if you're doing something that you're passionate about, you're going to be very attractive. So people like attracts like you're going to try attract people to you who can will be interested in your project or interested in your work, interested in what you're doing. All right. Being passionate about something in a positive is very positive, very attractive. All right. So let's talk about how you can how you can find these out. Uh, before we do that, let's go back to needs though. Um, key thing to understand about needs, and this is, I'm gonna share with this because it's very, very important in terms of your career is to have boundaries. And boundaries are just what people can no longer do to you or around you anymore. So you might have, people can't hit me, people can't criticize me, people can't yell at me. People can't make racist remarks about me or around me. People can't take advantage of me. People can't make sexist comments. People can't waste my time. People can't be late. People can't smoke around me. <laughs> you can make up any boundaries that you want. And everybody's boundaries can be a little bit different. I mean, some people are really bothered if you show up late, probably because they have a need to be respected. Uh, other people are, Oh, doesn't phase them, it's okay, I can entertain myself, you know, not so phased by it. So again, not everybody has to have the same boundaries. And nobody will know what your particular boundaries are unless you tell them. So you got to tell them. So that I'm going to give you a way to communicate your boundaries to people in a very professional way. So this is really important for career. It's also essential for personal relationships. So that's the great thing about this attraction stuff. It works for everything. You don't have to divide stuff up and think, oh, is this gonna work at work and not at home? No, it'll work everywhere, so that's great. So boundaries I'd like to think of as being the moat around your castle. So if you've got your castle here, and you've got your moat, you've got your little drawbridge so that people who are nice can come in and play with you. But you see this castle's got some pretty serious walls and they built castles for protection. So this is about protecting you from foreign attackers, from invaders, from people who meant harm. <laughs> so that's what castles were and they needed a lot of protection. So they had the walls, they had the drawbridge, they had the boat, it was a big deal. And you know, my husband uh, comes from Northumberland up, in, uh, up north in England and it's just one castle after another up there on the coast because the Vikings were pretty ferocious <laughs> and they needed this protection. So it's essential to have boundaries in place. 
And in relationships, if you don't have boundaries and you don't feel safe, you don't, you're too vulnerable. And without boundaries, you can't actually get your emotional and personal needs fulfilled. You can't get them fulfilled. So I'll give you a little example of how that works. Let me see if my next slide will tell you that one. Yep, we'll hold off that. So if you look, think about boundaries, uh, if you have the need, for example, to be appreciated, very common need. That's one of the top 21 most common needs. A lot of people have the need to be appreciated. Not everybody, but a lot of people do. Let's say that's your need. And now let's say that you have a, a friend or a colleague or a boss who's very critical. And they're always criticizing your work. And they're criticizing what you do. Or your spouse or partner is very critical of you. Oh, I don't, you know. The, so what happens then is that they're criticized. That's the opposite of appreciation. And so you can't feel appreciation in the moment you're being criticized. And so you feel really unhappy about that. It makes you very, very upset, annoyed, irritated. So without the boundary, so the boundary has to be in the negative. People can't do X to me anymore. So in this case, people can't criticize me without my permission. So you can get feedback and say, okay, I'd like some feedback on this boss. What, what, what could I do better here? That's fine. But you don't want to just get criticized. So that's a really important boundary to have, especially if you have the need to, pre to be appreciated. And if you don't have that boundary in place, you'll never get that need to be appreciated met. And you'll always be out seeking appreciation. So you'll be looking to get appreciation. You'll be doing things unconsciously or subconsciously to get your need to be appreciated met. And that's how it works. So people aren't consciously aware of their needs. So they run around doing things uh, unconsciously to get them met. And sometimes those things end up being negative behaviors. So I I'm pretty much certain <laughs> that at the source of every negative or kind of bizarre behavior, there's an unsatisfied personal or emotional need. So overeating, Usually it's the emotional need to be loved or cherished. Spending too much money over shopping, again, the need to be cherished, appreciated, loved can come from that. And that moment you buy something, you feel that little hit of satisfaction there. So we, we do things to try to get our needs met, not consciously aware of what we're actually, what's actually driving that negative behavior. Really, really powerful. So needs are so important in this attraction thing because obviously, <laughs> they make us unattractive, so we got to get those sorted, all right? Knowing what they are, first step. Putting in place boundaries is the second step. All right, so now you're wondering, all right, so I know I've got this need, because you've taken the quiz, you haven't done that yet, but don't worry, you will <laughs> later. You put in place your boundaries, now what do you do about it? Say you have a boundary that people can't criticize me. Well, how do people know that that's your boundary? When somebody criticizes you, what are you going to do about it? So here's the answer. And now this four-step model that I'm sharing with you, again, <laughs> this is one of the great things, works for everybody. It works for your boss, it works for your kids. I've got two kids and they will take you through this every step of the way. Uh, it works for colleagues, it works for family, it works for friends. So this is, again, one size fits all communication model. And it's these four steps. Inform is first, this is you'll start with, do you realize that you're yelling at me? All right, so if somebody's yelling at you, that's clearly a missing boundary. If, do you realize that felt like a critical remark? Uh, do you realize that you're 15 minutes late? Okay, so any one of those, just inform. And if you notice inform, it's not even a request. A request is a little bit stronger. I request that you lower your voice. I or I ask that you respect my time. So you can say, I ask or I request. Request is a little bit stronger. But that's step two. You only go to request after you've already informed. So inform is step one. <laughs> and you'll notice inform is basically holding up a mirror and saying, this is what you're doing. You're reflecting the behavior back at them. Oh, I'm sure, not, I'm sure you, you must not have been aware of the time. It's, it's 15 minutes after the hour. Or, so you just keep informing people gently in a neutral tone of voice. So request is next. I ask that you show up on time when you're meeting me. And then demand or insist. It's really important to me that you show up on time. If you do not show up on time, 
I will wait 15 minutes, and then after that, I will leave. Okay, so whatever your consequences are, they come at step three here, that's where consequences come. So for kids, they will definitely take you to step three every single time until they know you're serious. So you're gonna to have to put consequences in place with the kids and be prepared. That's different than a threat. So a threat might be, if you don't clean up your toys right now, I'm gonna uh, throw them all out. Well, that would be a threat unless you actually get a bag and throw out their toys. So it would be really wise to say, you know, I'll give you 20 minutes to clean up your toys and if you don't, I will come and clean them up for you uh, with a black bin bag, a garbage bag, and take them and donate them to charity. <laughs> so that might be better, but then you have to. You're gonna have to do it at least once. Once you do it once, you'll never have to do it again. Same with grown-ups, same with careers. So if you have a boss um, who, let's say I had a client who had a boss who was calling her at nine o'clock at night. And so she had a boundary uh, for peace. Her, her need was for peace and balance in her life. And she did not want to work at nine o'clock at night. And she did not want to receive a work call at nine o'clock at night. And so she had to have a boundary there. People can't call me for work in the evenings or on weekends. And that was her boundary. So she had to put in place, do you realize that it's nine o'clock and I consider this my personal time? Now, mind you, she's talking to her boss. So you want to get this right, right? <laughs> this person's in control of your paycheck. <laughs> so she wanted to stick with the neutral tone of voice. Now, what's happens, what happens is she said, you know, I asked that, um, she never actually had to go to like, ask. I think she did for meetings on weekends. She said, I request, after she informed, she said, do you realize that nobody wants to attend a Sunday meeting? <laughs> so she had to protect her team as well because he was used to having Sunday morning meetings to prepare for Monday. And she said, no, nobody wants to do that. Let's figure out a way that we can do this during Monday through Friday. So the request and then demand or insist, would, if she had to, she, you rarely have to go to demand or insist, but if she did, it would be, uh, you know, this is a requirement for me. If you continue to call me in the evenings, I'm afraid that I won't be able to work for you. So that would be your consequences. You prepared to quit. And then leave would be temporarily leave. I'm hanging up the phone right now when we can calm down and talk to each other without shouting. We'll resume the conversation. It might be that you leave the room. I'm gonna leave the room and when we can calm down, we'll continue. So, or it might be you leave a relationship or a job permanently because they do not respect your boundaries, okay? The key here to success is the flat, neutral tone of voice just say it the same way you would say, the sky is blue, do you realize? The sky is blue, I ask that you. Just works absolutely like a charm. If you raise your voice, if you start to yell yourself, of course, then you've lost control. The voice of power is that flat, neutral tone of voice. So this four-step model is the tool, that's your communication tool, for resolving any boundary issue that you have. And it works on any boundary that you have, which will then in turn enable you to get your needs satisfied, which will then have the positive bonus side effect of making you more attractive. So the client who put this model in place with her boss discovered that she got a promotion because with boundaries comes respect. With respect comes raises and promotions. If you, they don't respect you, you're a doormat, and people, even good, nice people, walk on doormats. So if you've got the doormat syndrome, all that means is, is you're missing your boundaries. You just need bigger, stronger boundaries. And women particularly, this is important, because women tend to think that it's not nice to enforce your boundaries. So if somebody shows up late, you don't want to be mean and say, oh, you were late. So these tools are very gracious, and you can use them because they're very, do you realize, no, I'm sorry, I didn't. I didn't know the time, I, I lost track of time or I got stuck in traffic. I know, of course, you would never intentionally show up late. So reinforce with a statement of positivity, of the positive behavior one. I know you respect me. I know you would never intentionally show up late. So you say that, they'll never show up late with you again. <laughs> or if they do, you can take it to request. 95% of the time, inform and request will solve all your problems. <laughs> you don't have to go beyond that. Occasionally, your children will take you there every step of the way to three, um, but sometimes you do have to leave, and that is the kind of, you know, be prepared to do that.
but that's the teeth of it. That's, that's saying, okay. And I've had clients who've left jobs uh, and then they, the, the, the ultimate result was they got a better job with better people at, with more money. So there may be some initial pain, but the end results are always positive. Questions about this? That's a big one. Any questions there? So Tulane, no questions yet, but we'll leave it for a few moments here in case anyone wants to type any in. Okay, good. Well, this is a really, really simple tool. It's very effective. Uh, I recommend that you write down your boundaries, write down how you will inform, write down how you will request. You kind of want to have your ammo in your back pocket. All right, so let's go over the second law of attraction. Now, this is that we're irresistibly attractive when we're doing what we love to do. So remember when I talked about the top of the pyramid? This is where you're living at that top. And that's because you're in alignment with your values and your passions. And you've oriented your life and your work around it. So when this happens, you're naturally attracted because you are doing what you love to do. It's that simple. Now, can we, can, can we kind of force this to happen. You know, the whole idea about attraction is that it happens naturally and effortlessly. But you actually can stack the decks very much in your favor. And one of the things is, let's say you're in a job you don't like. Start doing anything that you like to do, something that lights you up. Now, it may not be, let's say you like ballroom dancing. I love ballroom dancing. When I was working in banking, I used to go ballroom dancing three times a week because it energized me. So while banking was not my favorite job, I did not like that. Uh, it's perfectly, I had a lovely job, but yeah, it was not for me. It was not creative enough. It was, it was too restrictive. Uh, you know, my need for freedom and independence was completely squashed in the banking world. A lot of rules, a lot of regulations in banking. And a very strict hierarchy of how you succeed and move up the corporate ladder. So, you know, my needs for freedom and independence were not getting met in the bank. So this is the whole thing. Once I started doing coaching and owned my own business, ta-da, my need for freedom and independence is completely satisfied. I can start work at 10 o'clock. I can not work on Mondays if I don't want to. I can not work on a Friday, which is like I don't do. Uh, but the first time when I did leave the banking job and start my coaching business, I never worked on a Monday for years. <laughs> you know, the dreaded Mondays. For years, I took Mondays off and worked Fridays instead. <laughs> so it was Monday, I didn't want to go in, and I was just lying in bed gloating, thinking, I'm here on a Monday and everybody else is off to work. <laughs> I loved it. So, um, you know, th this is the great thing. The, the Knowing what your needs are can help you also choose a career that works for you, too, as well as you know if, it's, if needs are very important for you to be your best. And values, of course, icing on the cake, and it's the stuff we love. All right, so let's, I'm going to give you a few quick little tips on how you can figure out what your values are, All right? So there's over 100 different values. I don't have a quiz around this because usually, um, well, we do have a program called the True Values Program that you can take, but usually people are naturally drawn to their values and they're kind of easy to spot. You know, do you like to travel and have adventures? Are you into peace, beauty? Do you like to take risks, discover, invent, design? You know, those are what I'm talking about with values. So I'm going to give you a little exercise to try at home. And that is to think of what are the highlights of your life? So if I think what were the best times in your life? And then we'll think about what the underlying values are. So for example, one of the highlights in my life was the year I lived abroad in Spain. At Georgetown had a, um, a year abroad program where I could study abroad. And I lived my junior year abroad in Spain. Absolutely loved it. That whole year would have gotten a big yellow highlight. <laughs> I loved it. I had such fun. And when I was thinking back about that year being so fantastic, and why was that so fantastic? Well, my values are travel and adventure. So for me, I got to travel, travel around Spain, travel around Europe. It was just one great travel adventure year. And it still remains to this day one of my favorite years. Okay. So now, you, it may not be that you highlight a whole year. It might just be a moment. Maybe there was a, um, when, when I, I gave my high school graduation speech, that was at, at most a four or five minute speech. That was also a peak experience. That was a highlight of my life. Terrifying, mind you. But at that time, it was a real peak experience. And it showed me one of my core values was to lead and inspire people. So that was the value behind that activity. So I'd like you to do this as homework. 
to list the uh, highlights of your life. What were your peak experiences? When did you feel really lit up? You might have been slightly terrified, but terrified in a good way, like my speaking thing. Or just really fun. You know, some year, some time in your life, what were you doing? And then you want to think about those underlying core values. What were you expressing at that time? And that's the trick to finding out what your values are. I know there's, there's more tricks as well, but that's a good starting point, all right? So the key here is then to align what you love to do. So it might be a hobby that you love to do, to look at your highlights. And then my favorite, this is my cocktail question. <laughs> so if you don't have any time to find out what people really want to do in their lives, you, all you have to do is ask them, who do you envy and why? I call this the envy method because it's so effective. So if you notice you really envy somebody, you think, ah, oh. you know, or you get those feelings of envy. I love it because envy is green, right? You say you're green with envy. In my opinion, it's green for go for it because you envy what you secretly want for yourself, but don't think you can have it for whatever reason. Now, the coaching perspective is if some, someone did it and has it, you know, and they've achieved that, that means it's humanly possible to achieve, which means potentially it's humanly possible for you to achieve that and maybe even do it faster and better than they did because you've got, you can learn from their mistakes, from their experience, right? So the envy method is a really good shortcut to figuring out what you want. Core values list, that's the true values program. And I can, um, I can probably give that to you guys. Uh, it's on my website at lifecoach.com. If you search for it there, you can find it as well. But um, I can give it to you guys as a handout. We'll send that after. Uh, and then there's your natural talents and abilities. And this is figuring out what you're naturally good at, it, what your hardwired abilities are. So, you know, I went into to life coaching very skeptically, very reluctantly. You have to remember, this was 20 some years ago before there was any evidence that coaching was a viable career. And you know, so, of course, there were no coaching companies at that time. <laughs> now there's plenty. And there was no evidence that that was a real career. So this is going to happen more and more. And, and especially for the millennials, the young people now, you're going to be inventing careers that didn't exist before. You know, so this life coaching thing, my grandparents didn't have life coaches. My mother didn't have a life coach. And so this is just one generation. It's new. The, career, the whole profession is only about 20, 25 years old at best. You know, so it was brand new. That's how I got lifecoach.com as a domain name. I really was one of the first coaches out there. Uh, so I went into it skeptically and reluctantly. And there's this kind of a misconception that if something's a passion, you should know about it. Well, I, I didn't really know what I was good at. I didn't really know what my passions were. I was just a, a bank manager and doing well in the banking career and successful, but not fulfilled, not happy. So I had that feeling that I hadn't tapped into my full potential that there was something out there that might be better for me, but I didn't know what it was. So it's these exercises that will help you figure that out. And it might be that you end up inventing the next new career or profession. So knowing what your talents are, knowing what your abilities are, we actually use something called the Highlands Ability Battery in our company to test people. It's a three hour, three hour computerized assessment. We use that to test people to find out what their natural brain-wired abilities are. So some people, for example, can see in three dimensions. They can visualize. They're good at design. They can imagine things in three dimensions. Other, pe other people can't. Um, some people have musical ability, which we can test for, oddly enough, on a computer. And some people don't. So we can't all do everything, and we aren't good at everything. <laughs> some people are good at everything, and that creates its own problem because uh, very few jobs use all your abilities. So, but knowing what your abilities are is really, really helpful because oftentimes when you do something that you're naturally wired up to do, not only does it feel like play, it feels easy, but you can become masterful at it fairly effortlessly. And that's quite attractive. Mastery is attractive. We always want to work with somebody who's masterful. We want to work with the best. We want to have that mastery. So you can charge more if you're a master at something you will get a better promotion. Mastery is valuable. And that comes from having some hidden, you know, you're knowing what your actual abilities are and then developing those. <laughs> it's not enough to have the ability. You actually do need to, you might be naturally talented to go into say medicine or architecture, but you still need to go to school and get your degrees and before you can practice. Right. 
All right, so we have gone through a lot of content. <laughs> so hang in there. I know there must be questions and we have a few minutes at the very end here for some questions. So fire away, Sam, what have we got? Yes, of course. So we've got a couple minutes here before the one o'clock hour and a time for a couple questions. We likely will run over. So for those of you that do need to leave right at one o'clock, know that you will get the recording here tomorrow. So if you miss that, um, that answer, you'll get it tomorrow. So one question, Tulane. Um, so we talked a lot about passions. And what if the your passion is not something that you feel you can necessarily earn a living doing like for example if an individual loves dogs but doesn't want to be a dog groomer or start a pet sitting service how do you integrate those or how do you think about that in terms of a career yeah and this is a, such a great question because you know our our lives are our lives and so we've got our personal time and we have our working time but we're one person and your your body your you know you don't really need to i mean ideally you would have a, a, a business oriented around dogs in fact i had a client who said oh you can't make any money in dogs and i said are you kidding <laughs> people love their dogs there's loads of money in dogs uh, you know and so she ended up opening a business called hip hounds she's on my website her name is melissa melissa todd uh so i can talk about her because i don't talk about clients unless they say so but she's very happy to talk about it. And her business was Hip Hounds, which was a doggy daycare business. And she set it up while she was still working full time in human resources for a law firm and set it up so that it would, could run this whole business. She bought the, the land and everything for the business, got the, the site established, got the employees hired, all in her part time on evenings and weekends. She used her lunch hours, she used her evenings, and she did her weekends. So she set up this whole business and she had computers set up to monitor it so she could see what was going on with the dogs and everything. All of that around her passion for dogs. And then eventually she realized that she could actually quit her normal day job and just play with the dogs anytime she wants. She didn't have to go in because she set it up to run by itself with managers and, and people looking after it. So it truly was that she could dip in and out and play with the dogs whenever she felt like it. And she was also did dog rescue. So, you know, so I'm, I use that as an example because that's a real client example and you can look at her uh, story on, on lifecoach.com. But so we sometimes assume that just because I love it, it's not a viable career. <laughs> so that's a big mistake. It may well be. Now, let's say you are a golfer and you're a pretty mediocre golfer and you really love golfing but you know you, you're not gonna be good enough to teach golf and you're not gonna really wanna do this profession. So do golf, you know, on the evenings, weekends, lunch hours. And what you might wanna do is get into a sales job, like banking, <laughs> get into sales and banking or any sort of sales job where golfing is what you do to entertain your clients. So that way you get to do a lot of golfing on the job while you're working <laughs> and you get paid. <laughs> and you're going to get sales and whatever. So uh, you can actually take a passion like that and think, okay, well, you know, I'd like to get more golfing into my life. How can I do this? And look at careers that incorporate golfing. So even if you're just an average golfer, you, don't, you can actually do a lot more of it without having to make money at the golfing per se. Okay, so I, I'd like to encourage you to think about how you can incorporate more. Remember, like attracts like. So get out there and start golfing more often or whatever your thing is. If you like quilting, do more quilting. If you like ballroom dancing, do that. And especially in if, if you're in a job transition stage, you want to be really attractive to new people, new opportunities, to new jobs. You want to be the person in the interview who gets the job. So being attractive, let's say you were both working in boring jobs, you and another candidate. And the only difference between you and this other candidate is you were doing something in your free time that really lit you up and you were really excited about it and was really passionate. It might be golf, it might be basketball, anything, I don't care. It's a hobby. And the other person didn't have that in their life. So their life was just kind of bland. Now, who do you think is going to get the job? All qualifications being equal. Well, the person who has some joy and excitement in life is probably going to be a bit more lit up, a little bit more happier and energized and will get the job. So, so even if it's not related to your job, just the fact that you're doing something is going to make a difference. 
So do, do what you love, even if it's not related to your career, will help you attract the next career. Good question. What great. else? We yeah, thanks, Tulane. That was great. Um, so last question here before we wrap up. Um, you talked a lot about needs and managing those needs. So how do you recommend managing needs that are required for us to, to move forward in life? Like, for example, we need money to pay our bills. <laughs> <laughs> um, so how do you, how do you suggest managing those needs when you're going through these transitions or trying to identify what's next or trying to attract that career that you want? Yeah. So with money, it's because it's I've been working on the whole concept of the topic of money for some years doing research for my next book, which it will be about money. So stay tuned for that. Eventually I'll get that out there. But with money, it's just like anything else. You know, you can use attraction to attract money as well. So oftentimes it works better. First of all, you, you have to get your basic needs met. So that goes right down to the bottom of the pyramid. You've got to get your survival needs met because otherwise you're going to be really desperate. And, uh, you know, I've had clients, for example, I had a lot of new coaches, people who are starting coaching businesses or starting their own businesses. I actually tell them, get a day job, you know, wait on tables, do something, don't do a demanding corporate job, you know, because those usually take all of your energy, but something that you could do that would pay the bills while you're building your coaching practice or your new business or your, you know, idea, you know. So for, for, for the question here, if you, if you don't have money to pay your bills, you need to sort that out. So go, work, go get a job. <laughs> uh, and hopefully you can get something that, that you can do that enables you to work on your values and passions in your spare time. So what I say, you gotta, you gotta pay your bills or cut your expenses. So you might need to move back home with mom and dad, take in a roommate, um, move in with an older person and you buy groceries for them and help them mow the lawn or something and they give you free rent. You know, that, that happens a lot. Get creative. So you find a creative way to cut your expenses so that you don't need as much and when you don't need as much, that opens up your options. It makes you more attractive because you don't want to come across as needy or desperate, especially if you own your own business. <laughs> so you'll end up repelling the clients away from you if they sense that they need, you need them to uh, pay the mortgage or pay the rent. You'll, you'll, people will run from you because that financial desperation reeks. It really reeks. You will push people away. So get a job. It's okay to take a job that's not your passion, you know, as long as it is not so consuming that you have no other time to do anything else. Right? So get a job that covers your bills and has a little extra. It doesn't have to be the best job in the world, but it pays the bills. So think of carefully about what that might be. You don't want to take a job that's not sufficient either. You know, if you're working at McDonald's and that doesn't pay your bills, <laughs> you're, you're going to be in trouble because now you are working and have no time and have no, not enough money as well. So that wouldn't work. But with, you know, you should be able to find, there's so many jobs right now, the job market's good. So you should be able to get a really good salary right now. Um, and remember, we spend about 26 hours a week on TV and social media. That's enough for a part-time job. <laughs> so if you've got student loans to pay off or debts to pay off, you could take another part-time job and sort that out quickly. And I recommend that you do that because debt attracts more debt. You don't want that. Very unattractive. Good. Thanks, Tulane, for that. I appreciate it. Um, that was a great, great answer and good question there. So is there anything else that you want to share before we wrap up? Well, just quick go through some other resources for people. So we've got the books. Um, this is Coach Yourself to Success. That's the old edition. I should have put the new cover on. We've got a new cover that comes with 30 days of coaching online for free. So uh, you want to get the book that's newer that comes with that code. Uh, Lifecoach.com, loads of articles on there, loads of free resources. The emotional index quiz that I talked about is there. So you can take that. It's free. You'll find out your top four needs. Uh, I've just created a course. If you, if you think this is something you want to go into depth, I've just now released a course called Raise Your Emotional Intelligence. And it's about how to meet your needs, go through the boundaries, all that stuff we talked about. Um, of course, free coaching tips on my newsletter, and that is misspelled. <laughs> Sorry about that. Twitter, LinkedIn, YouTube, you know, all the social media stuff. You know, feel free to follow me on any of those. 
And uh, if you want to talk to me directly, uh, you can just send an email to info at Life Coach or admin at Life Coach. And my assistant will be able to contact you if you want some one-on-one -on -one coaching. And then we have something called a career change kit. And this is a kit I've packaged together with two different computerized assessments. We talked about the Highlands Battery for your abilities. We have something called the Workplace Motivators Report, which is about your values and uh, six hours of audio explanation, uh, which is me going through it bit by bit so that you understand what your results mean. Uh, and then of course, the Coach Yourself to New Career book is also relevant and helps those exercises, many more exercises on how to figure out what that right career is for you and get it as perfect as possible. So if you want that uh, kit, we are selling that at lifecoach.com. So we've got lots of tools to help you. This doesn't need to be a difficult thing. There is, there is potentially some work to do and finding out more about yourself, uh, but we can help you with that and speed up that whole process for you. So my personal take is that in the developed world, there's no reason why you can't either invent a career that's perfect for you or find a career that's gonna be really great for you. And if you can't do that, then at least be living your values as much as you can in your spare time. All right, so I hope that helps everyone. Yes, well, wonderful. Thank you so much again, Tulane, for all of this great information and sharing all of these resources. And thank you so much to everyone for joining us today and for hanging on here a few extra minutes as we answered those questions. Um, just a quick reminder to view upcoming webinars, request previous recordings. Please do check out our website at www.colorado.edu forward slash alumni forward slash webinars and have a great rest of your day and go buffs. Great.